Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with a delightful top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any future videos. Today's topic, 10 solid reasons for Christians to fully trust in Jesus. It's impossible to know or think too much about Christ. And why is that? Visit the Library of Congress in Washington and you can see more than 16 million books, yet every one of them is simply a recombining of the letters of the alphabet. Christ is God's Alpha and Omega, God's alphabet. The Word is everything God wants to say to us. Christ is God's grand superlative, the greatest and best of everything. So let's take a look at our top 10 list. Starting with number one, all things were created by him and for him. Now Dave, these are some of the biggest ideas in the Bible. So everybody better be sitting down for this. And I tell you, as I go through this, I'm just going to basically be reading the scriptures and notice how each of these show Christ as the absolute fullness of these ideas. And then we'll just have one practical question at the end of each characteristic. So, all things created by him and for him, those are the very words of Scripture in John chapter 1 and verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. And you can find the same ideas in Romans 11:36, Colossians 1, 16, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, and also in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, so the question then is, how should this affect our practical stewardship of things? If he's the creator of it all, he's the heir of it all, then everything I have, I realize, ooh, this belongs to Jesus, and I better be careful how I look after it. Number two, all things in the universe are sustained by him. Romans 11.36, for from him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. In Colossians 1.17, he is before all things, and in him all things consist, or hold together. We're actually sitting on one huge atom bomb. Scientists cannot tell us why the electrons that are negative forces don't pull the protons, the positive forces, out of the nucleus, or why the protons don't push each other apart. And they talk about strong bonds and weak bonds, but we know that it's the very authority of Christ that holds the universe together. And one of these days when he's done with the project, the elements will melt with fervent heat, the whole world will disappear in one cosmic bang. It didn't start with a big bang, but it's going to end with one. Number three, all scripture is the revelation of him. Again, the scripture says, as the Lord Jesus spoke to the Jews, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me, John 5, 39. And let's remember the story of the Lord Jesus walking on the Emmaus Road. In all the scriptures, he revealed to them the things concerning himself. So the Lord Jesus is the subject of every truth that we have in the Bible. You might say, how is the doctrine of sin related to Christ. I may understand the church and, and Israel and other doctrines, but the doctrine of sin? Yes, we might define sin or describe sin as simply everything that is unchristlike. He is the glory of God. He is the standard by which everything is measured. And so, yes, every doctrine traces itself back to the Lord Jesus. He is the truth. He is the embodiment of everything that is true. Number four, 
all the fullness of God's glorious being is revealed in him. I can't know anything about God outside of Christ. So we read, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. There are many other passages of scripture that tell us the same thing. Now, the question is, how should this influence the way we present ourselves to others? Because if we are complete in him, everything that we are and have can be traced to Christ, then how should we present ourselves to people around us, except as Christ's own representatives? It's his life. I live, yet not I. It's Christ's life in me. Number five, all of God's promises and blessings are found in him. Yes, he's called the Amen. That is the so be it, the seal of approval that God puts on everything. So again, the scripture says, all the promises of God in him, that is in Christ, are yes and in him, Amen, to the glory of God through us. 2 Corinthians 1.20 and Ephesians chapter 1, very well-known verse, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. So God has put every blessing and every promise in Christ. Now me, I'm just a walking bundle of need. Anywhere you poke me, you find another need. Every answer to that need is found in Christ. So as life is served up to me and I trip on this and fall on that and, and hurt here and, and feel an emptiness or a weakness there, it's a, an incentive to go to Jesus because he is the answer. It's not that he has the answer. It's not that he's just the healer. He's the healing. He's the medicine. He's the hope. He's the peace. He's the joy. He's what we need. And so Every time I discover a need within me, it's just another incentive to make a journey to the feet of Christ and discover, hey, God has blessed me with everything in Christ. He has promised everything to me in Christ. It's amazing that so many different people with so many different backgrounds, so many different needs throughout all time, they can all be met to where Paul can say that God will satisfy all your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Amen. You don't have to have specialists to go to, whether it's financial, physical, uh, marital, church issues. It doesn't matter what the issue is. He specializes in everything. Uh, number six, all resources necessary for godly living are available in him. <laughs> he not only saves us initially, and promises to take us home ultimately, but in process, he makes sure that everything we need for every day is made available to us. So we read, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who's called us by glory and virtue. So the question is, how should this affect our spiritual success rate? If everything we need, not only for life, but for godliness is made available, then the only reason I fail is because I haven't taken advantage of the resources that are made available to me in Christ. Number seven, all wisdom, knowledge, and truth reside in him. This is a great thing for college students to remember when they're sitting there listening to some professor perhaps undermining the authority of scripture, speaking ill of Christ and of Christian religion, when in reality the Bible says that by earthly wisdom men did not know God. Christ himself is the embodiment of that wisdom. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Colossians 2, 2 and 3. So the question is, how should this transform our understanding of Bible doctrine? How should this transform our thinking when it comes to our worldview? Um, people think, people have opinions, but 
Jesus knows. <laughs> Whatever he thinks, that's the definition of truth. So if I come to know what Jesus thinks about something, as the scripture says, let God be true and every man a liar. In other words, if all the world's experts were lined up on one side and they all agreed about something, and Jesus was on the other side and said, I disagree, I say, well, I stand with Jesus on this one. Because he is the embodiment of all wisdom, all knowledge, and all truth. Number eight, all judgment has been delivered to him. People have this idea that they, when they stand before God, they'll make this appeal to God and say, God, you have no idea what it was like for me to struggle through life on earth. You've been sitting up here in your ivory palace with your angels to serve you. But no, the judge who will be making the final determination is Jesus. God has delivered all judgment into his hand. And therefore, he does know what it's like to be homeless, to be hungry, to be thirsty, to be misjudged, to be persecuted, to be falsely accused. He knows what it's like to, to be abandoned by his friends, to be betrayed. He, he's got it all. And so he is the righteous judge, someone who not only can meet the righteous standards of a holy God, but who has lived in human experience a flawless life and therefore has the right to be the judge of humanity. And when we think about this issue of judgment being delivered into his hand, we asked ourselves the question, how does this affect our faithfulness and our desire to please him? Because in the end, it really doesn't matter what people think about things. It doesn't matter what I think about things. It's what does Jesus think about it? And if that's the determination, and I think about that going into a circumstance, it'll certainly affect the choices that I make in life. Number nine, all salvation is in him and he is reconciling all things to himself. The tremendous drawing power of Jesus, he not only holds the physical universe together, but the Lord Jesus has this moral suasion that is pulling the whole world to himself. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. When God raised his son from the dead, he seated him far above all, above all principality, all power, all might, all dominion, every name that's named, every king, he is their king, the king of kings. Every lord, he is their lord. And so when we think about Christ's authority, he's using that influence not to scatter, but to draw. And that's his longing to bring all things together to God, to bring all things into alignment again with God. And so we read concerning him that this influence that he has Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the scripture says that he is reconciling the things that are in heaven and the things that are on earth. Now, it doesn't say under the earth because these people have made their choice. Jesus is a perfect gentleman and he's not going to force people into a relationship with God, but he has made possible every relationship coming into, into intimacy with God if only they will allow Jesus to do this work in him. So when I ask myself the practical question, um, how should this motivate my life in my, in my witness if, if this is Christ's desire to bring people to God, then as ambassadors we plead with people in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. We should not be scattering by giving our opinions, dividing people the way we see in our world today. We should be seeking to draw people to Christ and draw people into a relationship with God. We should be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. So God help us to do that as ambassadors calling people to be reconciled to the Lord. Number 10, all creatures will be subject to his eternal reign. Aren't these beautiful words? I never get over the joy of them. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow 
of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, Philippians 2, 10 and 11. My father used to speak about this and say, for one moment in all of history, every God-conscious creature will be agreed about one thing. Jesus Christ is Lord. I don't think anyone will be forced to do this. They'll simply say, you won. You did it. And they will acknowledge his supremacy. And as he would add, for one moment in all of history, every God-conscious creature will fulfill the purpose for which they were created, which was to glorify God. That's what it says, to the glory of God the Father. So every demon, Satan himself, Baha'u'llah and the Buddha and Confucius and Mao and Stalin and Hitler and all peoples and all angels, all God-conscious creatures, with a mighty rustle will bow their knees and with one voice they will all agree on one incontrovertible fact. Jesus did what he said he would do. He won the day. Three cheers for Jesus. Now, since these 10 things have focused on all things, we've got a bonus thing. Number 11, all who believe will be reconciled and gathered together as one in him. So this is the ultimate objective of the Lord Jesus in bringing everything together, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. What is the big idea? That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, things in heaven and things in earth in him. So this grand objective of God is for ultimate intimacy. The church, the kingdom, the nation of Israel, uh, the angels, martyrs and confessors and prophets and priests and apostles all gathered together. The elders represent this huge number and just as the world will sometime recognize his lordship, so we have this vision in heaven of all the redeemed bowing down, recognizing his mediatorship, his redemption work. You are worthy for you have redeemed us to God by your blood. And they will say, worthy, worthy is the lamb. And that is the climax of history. When God has had his son on his throne, sit with me on my throne until I make your enemies your footstool. And at that moment, the Lord Jesus will be invited to take his own throne and he will sit supreme in the universe. And amazingly enough, we will be invited to reign with him in that glorious position. This is not a fairy tale. This is really going to happen. And I plan on being there. And it's going to be a universe changing moment when everything at last is brought into alignment and it all has to do with our relationship to God through Christ by the Spirit.